morning. Our scripture today is from the book of Psalms, uh, chapter 118, verses 14 to 16 and 19 to 24. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go through them, and I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, through which the righteous shall enter. I will praise you. For you have answered me, and I have become my salvation. The stone which the builder rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Let us stand and praise the Lord.
continue to worship the Lord with your thoughts focused on Him and your eyes looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith, running with endurance the race that is set before us. Remembering Christ, considering Him who endured such contradiction of sinners against Himself. And let you be weary in your own minds. Trust, follow, see Him as He is. And we pray that we are indeed sensing His presence today. It's so good to have you here in the, the family of God on this corner of, of Zion. Um, we believe, we call this a family reunion, and thanks for coming out, family. Uh, it means a lot. And we pray that God will send those He wants to be here, so you're an answer to prayer. And we have some folks visiting, and we always appreciate that. We have some regular folks that have been under the weather, and they're on top of the weather, so they're back. Good to have you as well. There's still people that are out traveling and so on, but we do want to thank you that you're here, and thank God that we're together in this place. Please remember to pray as we would lead you in prayer. In the bulletin, we have the prayer sheet this morning, as always. Continue to, um, throughout the week, take those to the Lord. Tuesday morning, we have a ladies' prayer team that meets faithfully. Wednesday, we have prayer meeting for the church at noon. Um, you're welcome to come, but certainly at home with your families, and certainly now as we come into His presence. Since the last Sunday of the year, and I had, I'm going to bring that up sometime, right? I can't believe it's the last Sunday of the year. I'm becoming my father. Life is passing me by so quickly. My parents used to say how fast time would fly, and I'm saying it all the time. But it's been a beautiful year and a wonderful year in his service, and we look forward to what God has for us in the next year. But I'm going to ask as we bow our heads for prayer that you would take a moment just in the silence there to talk to the Lord and to thank him for one thing. Would you do that, please? Close your eyes, bow your head. This is, I'm leading in prayer. I'm not performing in prayer. So let's all pray, shall we? Take a moment, thank the Lord for one thing. Um, boy, you have a lot to choose from me. Eh? Take a moment to thank him. And take a moment to ask for that one thing. Something that might not be in the bulletin, something I don't know about, won't cover, but try in your heart. You need to give it to Jesus. Take a moment to share that request with our Father. God, Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, your only Son and our only Savior. We come before you in the name of the Matchless One, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the Lily of the Valley, the bright and morning star, the fairest of 10,000 to our souls. To us who believe he is precious, and we come to you in the name of the Precious One. We enter your gates with thanksgiving. We come into your courts with praise. We give thanks to you because you are good. Your mercy endures to all generations. We thank you that we have been recipients of that mercy and grace, neither deserved, both needed, both appreciated. Father God, it's been a whirlwind for some of us. 2018 has been, we've had much of good and much of bad. Perhaps some here have had more bad than good, more bad recently. Father God, I pray you'd help them and meet their needs, comfort their hearts. You are the healer of broken hearts. You are the restorer of broken relationships. I pray that you'd bring your peace and your joy and your mending to those who need it. Some of us, Father, would say it's been the best year of our life. Wonderful things have happened. We rejoice in that and we thank you. And even those most wonderful times were just a foretaste of glory divine because they came through the loving hands of our Father. Because every good and every perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, with whom is no variation or shadow of turning. And you have been good in the past, you are good in the moment, you will be good in the future. You have loved us. You do love us. You will love us. There is nothing that we have done that has taken your love away from us. You haven't even had second thoughts about that love. There's nothing that will happen in the future, a future unknown to us but very much known to you. But there is not one moment, not one second in the new year that your love will ever change for us, that you will ever take away any of the things you've given to us. That's the kind of God we serve. That's the kind of God who holds on to us. You have rescued us. You have redeemed us. You have regenerated us. Now refresh us. Help us, Father, to look forward with, with excitement. Help us to say with the psalmist, I have set the Lord ever before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be moved. 
oh Lord, the times are not good and, and the nation is in turmoil and our own city and community has its issues. But we will take a stand with the Lord Jesus Christ and the Father through the power of the Spirit. And the Church of Jesus Christ is advancing and the gates of hell are not and shall not and cannot prevail against it. And this is the church to which we belong through faith in Christ. And I ask Father God, that you'd help us with all the needs in the bulletin and all the needs on our hearts and all the needs of those that we know of, our loved ones, our family. We would bring them to you and cast them upon you because you care for us. And that you give us confidence that you will answer in your way and in your, in your reasons for your honor and glory. I thank you so much, Father God, for the chance to worship you in spirit and in truth. And I thank you that we've done that. May we continue, Father, as we move into the giving of, of your tithes and our offerings in a spiritual act of worship. For it is truly that. And that you help us as also to continue to worship you through the music and, and, and testimony and prayer and the opening of your word. Would you receive these gifts from us? You, the greatest giver of all. And we ask it in Jesus' name. me, Lord, of all my silly saturates, how I want to be all and only yours. Take away the clutter in my life every day. Make me like a child at play. Give me joy. I love to laugh and cry with you. You've become a friend with me all the time. Help me to be patient as I watch and as I pray. Growing in your love each day. Lord, show me the way. When the time comes, I want him to know me. When the time comes, I want to be there. When the time comes, I want to be ready. When Jesus comes to take me, take me home. Tell me, Lord, I want your love to overflow, running free through me to a lonely world. Let me share that simple truth that sets the people free, how I want them all to see, Lord, how it can be when the time comes, I want him to know me. When the time comes, I want to be there. When the time comes, I want to be ready. When Jesus comes to take me, when Jesus comes to take me, when my Jesus comes to take me, take me You know, there are a lot of mysteries in life, <clears throat> puzzles that perplex us, situations that uh, stump us. These are conundrums. 
and they defy logic. They make no sense at all. One of the things that puzzles me is the lack of a greater response to the gospel in our community. Think about it a moment. There are loads of churches in the area, 60 plus in our community. And we have divine resources to get the job done. There's no confusion about the task. The Lord made it clear. It's not like we're waiting for further instructions here. It's not like we don't want this. It's not like we haven't expended <clears throat> effort and, and money and prayer. Our own church has been preaching Christ on the corner of 27th and Emmaus for more than 100 years. Yet despite years of effort of all of our churches, Zion remains largely unchanged or maybe changed even for the worse. And so the lack of community transformation is the great conundrum of the Great Commission. And with the new year mere hours away, I want to get back to the basic message of discipleship, God's plan to reach the world. You don't get more basic than Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20. This is my favorite, or one of my favorite texts. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Matthew, the first gospel, Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20. I want to read that for you. I want you to hear it in a new and a fresh way. I know you've heard it many times before. It's been a favorite of this church. It's been a favorite of the church, right? But I want you to, to hear it again. And I'm, I want to show you today three reasons why I think we're not being as effective as we can be for Christ. Three reasons why we're not being successful in the thing that we all want. And then three words from the, the same passage and one other that would help us maybe change change that situation. Matthew 28, verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Now, to be sure, the sovereignty of God needs to be in the mix here. God doesn't work according to our plans or on our schedule. So you could say, well, some things aren't happening because it's not God's will or it's not God's time, and I'll grant you that. Personal responsibility is also a big issue. We can't make decisions for those people outside our doors, outside our family, outside the faith. Don't you wish you could? Have you ever thought about that? Oh, how I wish I could decide for Christ for someone else. But we can't, of course. But I see some other reasons, some other things that are, that are perhaps missing, lacking in our own situation. And again, these <clears throat> three words within the three reasons, I'm hoping will kind of change it up for the new year, for 2019. Wouldn't that be a great goal? Let's pray, and then we'll move through the text and see if we can get there. God in heaven, I thank you so much that we can come before you. <clears throat> thank you for your word, which is forever established in heaven. It is not the work of man. It is not the uh, compilation of a committee. It's not a denominational thing. It's not even a religious thing. This book does not contain the Word of God. It doesn't become the Word of God. It's some magical moment when it makes sense to us. It is the Word of God. It was given as the living Word of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the person of God may be complete and able to live the life that you call us to live. And so I thank you for your Word. I ask your blessing as we would look at this familiar passage, but show us things that we haven't seen before, or, or make it so real to us today that, that it, it gets through all the excuses that, that we tend to make. And pray, Holy Spirit, that you would illuminate the text and that we would make application. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. And the first reason why we're not so successful, not as successful as I think we should be, is that we tend to overemphasize the difficulty of the task. <clears throat> Reaching the world. Now think about this. Reaching the world for Christ seems like the ultimate mission impossible. I was watching one of my favorite TV preachers today on, on TV. Some of you folks know, Sunday school class knows. I'm always quoting like the David Jeremiah. And he was preaching in India at a little larger congregation than this. He preached to 200,000 people that Sunday. Um, five services. So that was just 40,000 each. That's a little more manageable. Not. 
and he was preaching to them. At the beginning, he said, there's 1.3 billion people in India. Can you even comprehend that? I can't. Billion with a B? 1.3 billion people in India alone. 2,500, I think, said different people groups, 30 different, 30 different religions, or different languages, I'm sorry, and very, very few Christians. That can overwhelm us. Going to all the world with billions of people? But, of course, it's not impossible because the God who commands always enables. And since Jesus has made it abundantly clear what the mission is, the problem is then with us. He's told us what we need to do. And I believe that we have a problem with doubt. We see that in verse 17 because here these, the 11 disciples came to him. This is post-resurrection. They finally figured out, even at the empty tomb, they didn't quite get it, remember? They saw the empty tomb, and they still didn't get it. It tells us that in Scripture. But now they've gotten it. Now they've met with him. Now they've had a few days with him. And they saw him in verse 17. By the way, they didn't know that the chapter 20, verse 20 was coming. They didn't know that Jesus was going to leave them. So they're just meeting him. And they worshipped him. I get that part. But some doubted. And I think that's our problem as well. The word doubt here speaks of, of wavering. And sometimes, even though we're ready to worship the Lord... We're not doing it with all of our heart because we wonder and we waver and we wander. You see, worshiping the Lord is pretty easy. Working for the Lord, maybe not so much. We come together in a beautiful sanctuary. I'm I'm biased, but I believe it's the most beautiful sanctuary in Zion. We come together with beautiful people. I'm biased, but the most beautiful, wonderful people in Zion. And we enjoy the music, and we enjoy the fellowship, and the kids do their part, and, and it's just it's a wonderful thing, isn't it? But we don't understand that God wants us to do more. So beyond the hour and a half or so that we spend here, <clears throat> on Sunday there is this whole rest of the week. <clears throat> and sometimes we doubt. Now look back at chapter, well, maybe I have it on the board here. I do. Matthew fourteen thirty one. Remember when, when Peter was walking on the water? Now, think about that for a moment, by the way. I mean, I've been on the Sea of Galilee in a boat where you're supposed to be, you know. Um, I flew to Israel, and of course, I didn't fly. I sat in an airplane, and the airplane flew, but you know what I'm saying, right? And I was on the sea, and some of us other ones here today were as well. Kind of cool. Can you imagine a storm coming up? Now, we had a, a wind, a spring zephyr, and they turned the ship around, and we went back to shore. And we paid for a whole a whole tour of the lake. We didn't get to... I don't know if you guys realize that. Those of you that were new there, I've been there before and it's supposed to be a lot longer tour. But as we got out there, the wind got gusty and and, uh, they turned us around because a storm was coming up. Can you imagine a full-fledged storm with a smaller boat than that and Peter has the faith to get out of the boat and walk on the water to Jesus, right? Cool stuff. In chapter 14, verse 31, that's where Matthew talks about it. <clears throat> but remember, the Bible says that, that Peter took his eyes off the Lord. Maybe he was slapped by a wave. I don't know. But immediately, when he, when he looked away from the Lord, he started to sink into the water. And immediately at that moment, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you waver? It's the same, the same uh, word used here at the end of the book. Why did you doubt? Why did you waver? So it wasn't like he had no faith. He obviously had faith to get out of the boat in the first place. But at some time in the difficulty of the moment, just for that second, he took his eyes off Jesus and put the eyes on the problems, and down he went. Now, I can relate to that. I know you can too. We're talking about people who are worshiping the Lord, who love the Lord, who have faith, but who waver in their faith. Now, I think sometimes that's the problem. We know we're supposed to share the gospel. We really, really want to. And we've, we said, today's the day. And then somebody's coming toward us, and we feel the Spirit saying, speak to that one. And at that moment, either we're going to do it, or we're going to what? Waver. Waver a little bit. So I believe that's the problem here. And God gives us a solution. In verse 17. <clears throat> He says, some doubted. We see that God gives us the, the solution, and he, He's already given it to us. Uh, but He gives it to us specifically in verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All power or authority, all power has been given to me in heaven and on earth. The solution to wavering, to doubting, is the power of God. And so that's our first word, by the way. And you know, it's there. The first word is power. 
If our reason for not being successful, listen, if our reason for not being successful is that we're overemphasizing the difficulty of the task, then when God says, I've got you, I've got your back, if God says you've got all the power you need, all power in heaven and on earth, which is like all there is, wouldn't that help us overcome that particular reason? Wouldn't it make it easier if we know we're supposed to and we've had our devotions and we're raring to go and somebody's coming toward us and we feel that sense and then we say, eh, maybe not. And the Lord says, he, re he reminds you, all power is given. Therefore, go. Doesn't that help you to open your mouth? I believe it will. I believe it must. And so we have this first reason and this first word. God wants us to do something and he gives us the power to do it. Now, the mandate that Jesus is about to give is his right because God has given all power and authority to him. Jesus said, I have all authority. I have all power. And that's, that's wonderful for you, Jesus. But we're going to see that the most important part is not just that he has the authority, but that he gives that to us. In Daniel 7, verse 13 and 14, in the Old Testament, we see even even there, that the Son of Man has all power. Then to him, the Son of Man was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, all nations, all languages should serve him. His dominion, Jesus' dominion, is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. Did you know that that was in the Old Testament? And then Jesus fulfilled that in the New Testament. This is our king. This is our savior. This is the one who's telling us to go. He has a mandate he's giving us, and he has the authority to do that. And again, this is the really cool part because he has passed that authority on to us. That's shown by the word therefore. <clears throat> Have you ever wondered why verse 19 has the word therefore? What have we told you about scripture? Whenever you see therefore, check to see what it's there for, right? It, it, it's pointing back to something. You don't walk up and the first thing you say is, therefore, my name is Doug. If I've been introduced and somebody else tries to say they're Doug or something, therefore has a reason. Therefore, go. Well, it goes back to what he just said. All authority, all power has been given to me. Therefore, you go. Wait a second, Jesus. You got the power, you go. No. He said, I'm going to heaven. Remember what he said one time? He said, as long as I am in, I love this, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. But where is Jesus right now? Well, he's in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. And you see, you know your theology, right? And so now he says in Matthew 5, 16, only let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus said, when I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. With him in heaven, we're the light of the world. It's a reflected light, to be sure. But we're Jesus' feet and his hands and his mouthpiece. And so what he's saying to us is, when you go forth, when you go forth in my name, you are, it's like Jesus has shown up. So if I have all power to do this and to give the mandate and to see people saved and to give the gospel, I am giving it to you. I am assigning it to you. I want you to use this while you are here and I am not. And the Holy Spirit is Christ within. We get that. But if we're not Jesus to the world, they will not see Jesus. Think about that. Where else are they going to see Jesus? We are his representatives. We are his body. We are his church. And so when the Holy Spirit came, Jesus said this about him. He will live within us. He will bear witness of me, Jesus said. He will glorify me, Jesus said. The Spirit of Christ within us is Christ, and we are in the world living for him. So our mission of disciple-making is possible because our master is powerful. So for those of us that are timid and trembling, and, and isn't that all of us? I mean, how many people like to go out and cold turkey uh, share the gospel? Go ahead. Put your hands up. I dare you. Hey, praise the Lord. That's right. And I was going to say I would do some counseling, but you're right. You do. You're not the least bit afraid. A lot of Most of us don't want to do that. Um, it's just, it's kind of scary. But the, the power of God and, and, the, and the principle, the mandate, helps us to do that as well. So.
So the Church of Jesus Christ is God's primary agent for missions. We proceed in His name. We preach in His name. We proclaim in His name. We pray in His name. Don't let fear, <clears throat> don't let doubt keep you from sharing Christ with your neighbors and friends in 2019 because you've got all that you need to get the job done. So the first reason I think that we don't do better is because we're overemphasizing the difficulty of the task. And for that, God gives us the word right here in the Great Commission. Power. Don't skip the power. The power lays the foundation for the proclamation. All right? The next thing I think we do is we exempt ourselves from the fulfillment of that task. We may not say it, but we act as if the Great Commission is for the paid guys, you know, the pastors and, and the missionaries, and, and not for the rest of us. But I see... In my Bible, all the disciples being there, they didn't have any leaders yet. There was no pecking order. <clears throat> the 11 disciples came, and they met with Jesus, and he spoke to them. <clears throat> and here's our second word, by the way. <clears throat> Go. That's not a suggestion. <clears throat> That's not if you get a chance. It's not, boy, I sure wish you'd do this, but you don't have to. It's a command, and it's given to all God's people. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. Well, maybe I misspoke. I mean, if you're not a disciple of Christ, it's not for you, but we're disciples. We're followers of Christ. And so there's no way for us to say, that's not my gift. That's not my strength. That's not what I do. We all are supposed to go. And when we go, we go with a divine assignment to make disciples. Do you know that disciple-making is the way to reach the world? I, I, I read about this once in a statistical analysis that if one person <clears throat> leads someone to Christ and they spend six months discipling them, and then the person that led that one to Christ and the person who's now discipled, if they both do the same thing, one each, it, 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 it said, in fact, ten years you could reach the world. Billions of people. Does that sound impossible? It makes a lot of sense to me. So I'm saying it is certainly divinely possible, and it's humanly possible because he's given us the command and he wants us to make disciples. Now, let me ask you to, again to interact. How many people were saved <coughs> in a Billy Graham crusade or something like that? Anybody? Praise the Lord. Anybody else? <coughs> Every time I ask that question, that's about the response I get. There are some people who were saved, and, and I, I thank the Lord so much for Billy Graham and men and like him and women like him and, and so on. But most of us didn't come to Christ that way. So we need to understand that our responsibility is to go and to reproduce ourselves. We're on assignment for the Master. Only the tiniest of minorities will take the gospel across the world. The vast majority will take the gospel across the street. And that's your job and mine. So we go with a divine assignment, and we go with a divine assurance. In verse 20, So go therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and teaching in obedience is the great omission and the great commission, but that's another message for another time. And lo, he says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So the assurance is that as we are going, as we are making disciples, as we are being faithful with the mandate, Jesus is with us in a special way, now, he's with us always, right? I mean, he's, he's everywhere. But the promise was made to those who are making disciples as they go out. So in a very special way, I believe you will feel the presence of the Lord with you. Have you ever shared the gospel with somebody, and you're sitting there, and of course, they don't know you're talking to Jesus, but you're talking to them, but I'm talking to Jesus the whole time. Amen? And I have had times, basically every time, they'll bring something up, and I say quickly, Lord, help me with that one. That's a good point. Remind me of that verse. Help them to see that. I'm praying the whole time that I'm talking because I'm able to do that. Because why? Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I'm scared. I don't want to share the gospel. I might lose a friendship. I might lose a job. In some parts of the world, I might lose my life. Jesus is there saying it's okay. Lo, I am with you always. Please don't make that just theology. It's reality. He is with us always, even to the end of the age. So we have this assurance that he is there as we go. 
So the first reason that I'm, I'm thinking we don't succeed and, and it's not more transformation, the big conundrum and the, the big commission, is that we overemphasize how tough it is and, and we shirk away. We waver. And he says, I've given you power. The second reason is we exempt ourselves and we say, it's somebody else's job. And the Lord says, no, it's your job. Go. Go with my assurance. Go on my assignment. Go with my authority. The final reason I believe from the text that we don't have success as we'd like to and we, we want to is that we rarely enter the actual zone for the task and this I think is the main reason I think this is the main reason you and I know what we're supposed to do we know that we have power we know that God with us is greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world but I, I feel like we're living our lives in a parallel universe the majority of people in America don't get converted in the church. Am I right? How many people get saved in a local church? Oh, it happens. Praise the Lord. It happens. But most of the unbelievers, you, you know this is true, right? They don't know what's going on here. They don't care what's going on here. They're living their lives. Remember when Brandon came from Teen Challenge a couple weeks ago? That little young guy that's the uh, uh, inpatient or output or input or whatever the guy in charge. Um, and he said, hello, church. You've got a good thing going here. And I agree with him. I love Sundays. I look forward to Sundays. I would come even if he didn't pay me. I mean, I love coming Sundays. You've got a good thing going, church. But the world doesn't know a thing about that. They don't care about that. And if the church spends all of its time yelling, shape up to the world, they're going to be saying, shut up, because they don't care. There's got to be more to it than us just putting up a tent and inviting people in to be revived, whatever that means in that context. We need to go out. And this has been my my issue for, well, since 1998, but certainly since I've been here. People are not coming through our doors, which is actually okay and logical when you think about it. Unbelievers are never commanded to go to, to the church. The church is commanded to go out. Now, they're welcome, and we share the gospel from the pulpit, and so it's important. But I'm a realist, friends. I typically preach to the choir every Sunday morning, and then I send you guys out to sing out there, am I right? Because we're already part of the family of God. So we celebrated the incarnation of Jesus last Tuesday. God with us. It's even in his name, Emmanuel. In order to redeem us, Jesus had to deliver the goods in person. He didn't save us from a distance. He could have. He didn't. And we won't reach unbelievers with the good news of salvation by sitting in a pew or merely writing a check so someone else can go. We need to live incarnationally. What does that mean? We need to live where people live. We need to shop where people shop. We need to have people around us who aren't believers to whom we can share the gospel of Christ. I've told you before, one of my pet peeves back in Michigan, kind of the, the bucket of the Bible belt, there were so many Christians... You think, we got a lot of churches. Go to Grand Rapids sometime. So many churches, big churches. And they had something called the Christian Yellow Pages. Maybe they have that around here, too. If you've got a copy of the Christian Yellow Pages, please line the, the bottom of your birdcage with it or throw it away. i got to be honest with you. i got to be honest with you. If I'm doing everything with Christians only, then I'm never going to fulfill the mandate because I'm hanging out with people like me. And where's the fun in that? We need to be out where the people are. We need to be sharing the gospel. If I don't know anybody who's not saved, then I'm not going to share the gospel. And that's just, that's just obvious. So we're the body of Christ. And I'm here to tell you the body needs to get out more. Out of the sanctuary, out of the streets, out of our bubble, and onto the boulevards, out of our comfort zone, and into the battle zone. So to get to the crux of the matter, there's one more word. One more word. And I take it from Mark's account. Could you read that with me? This is the one that we really know, right? Uh, Mark 16, 15. Let's read it together. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. i got to tell you that in the last few weeks, I have decided that the most important word in that verse is what? What do you think? That's what I... Yeah, that's a good one. I'm going to give you um, A for that. But that's what I, I've moved... I think something else. I think it's the word into... I think it's the word into. I'll get go from Matthews. I think, I have a concern that the church of Jesus Christ is living parallel to the city around us. We know we're supposed to go, but I think 
Now hear this. We go through the world. Occupied territory. We leave our safe homes and we come to a, a wonderful safe sanctuary. What does sanctuary mean? A safe place? And then we go back in our, in our safe cars to occupied territory, occupied by the devil, and back to our safe homes. My concern is that we're not actually interacting or interceding or intersecting with the world around us. So I think we need to stop living parallel lives to the city. I think we're next to the city. I think we're beside the city. We're in the same general area as the city, but I don't think we're truly in it. We have great Sundays, wonderful programs, hardworking volunteers, but the world around us doesn't have a clue what we do. How difficult is it to go to church on a Sunday? I mean, the doors are open, parking is free, there's great seats in the front, like always, right? You can always get a seat in the front. We don't charge for anything. We sing with you, we laugh with you, we shake your hand. How many places do they shake your hand and give you a hug nowadays? I mean, some places are afraid to do that, but we're the church. We're still going to do that. It shouldn't be that difficult to go to church. We're saying, come on in. There's no admission. There's no Sam's Club. You know, members only. Come on in. I don't care what you look like. I don't care what you dress like. Right? So where are the people? Remember that thing growing up? We had, here's the church and here's the steeple. Open the door. Where are the people? Well, they're not coming in. They're not beating the doors down. And again, that, that's kind of okay because unbelievers aren't, aren't told to come in here. But I'm just saying they're living their life. He's on the, down the road going, do what did he, did he, dumb, did he do? They don't know what's going on in here. They drive right by. They don't realize that, that God, listen, the God of the universe is being worshipped. They don't know. That one really knocks me out. Just a few feet away, there are people who are passionately in love with Jesus, right? There are people who love this book. There are people who live their whole... Sunday isn't about getting the 50% off sale after Christmas. Sunday is about Jesus and about the Father and the Spirit. And they haven't got a clue. And they drive glibly by. And they live their whole lives that way. And that's not okay. The only way we're going to have an impact on the city is if we get out of this parallel thing and start moving closer you see, the church does not exist for the sake of the church. The church exists for the sake of the world. God has placed us here to be a ministry, to be a witness. If we're not going to be a witness, just go home. Let's just go to heaven. I mean, we all want to go to heaven. But he left us here for a reason. So he didn't leave us here so we could be happy, because I'd be happier in heaven, wouldn't you? He didn't leave me here so I can be healthy. I can be healthier in heaven without all the push-ups, sit-ups, and gym memberships, right? He didn't leave me to have a, a wonderful life. He left me here as a witness. Like we saw last week, outside the gate, outside the establishment. And so he wants us to stop living separately and to start penetrating, penetrating the city, to intersect with our neighbors, to interact with their lives, to impact them with the truth of the gospel. What we do here on Sundays benefits the church. What we do out there, Monday through Saturday, benefits the community. Listen, our best work's done out there. Look at your bulletins. You still got them there? You're using them for notes or take your bulletins. Every week we have, if we have for years, have you noticed at the beginning it says on the left side, inside, gathered for worship. You see that? What is the purpose of church? The church gathered worships corporately. We sing praise to the Lord. We, we give tithes and offerings, and that's worship. And, and we listen to the Word, and that's worship. And we, we fellowship, and we love each other, and it's a hugamony every time. Right? Gathered for worship. But then it says later at the end, what does it say? Scattered for work. The, the church... Listen. The job of the church can't be complete with two hours a week. Would you agree? I love what we do on Sundays. When I was a teenager, I wore my suit all day long. That's weird. But I love dressing up for church. My parents said, he's going to be a pastor. Because at 5 in the afternoon, 5 in the I was still wearing my suit. My dad was a pastor. He took his off as soon as he got out of there. So I was going to be a pastor. I, I love Sundays. I love the dressing up. I love everything about it. But that's not the whole of it. It's a very small part of it. So what we out, do out there should benefit the community. 
And out there is where we live. And out there is where we serve. And, and out there is where we suffer. And, and out there is where we spend 166 out of the 168 hours of every week. Into speaks of living among the folks. Not doing periodic drive-by events for them. Uh, a couple times a year we'll invite you in. Please. Spare me. Spare me. We need to be going where they are. It includes inviting unsaved neighbors to our homes for a barbecue, chatting over the fence, getting to know them as we talk or walk our dogs, rather, on the same street. It means taking the initiative, starting the conversation, building the bridge of friendship that can become a pathway to life. You can write a check, and that's fine, but we need to be writing wrongs as well as writing checks. We need to defend the powerless and befriend the homeless and encourage the hopeless not withdraw on a convent basis. Every Sunday morning is the, the monastery I- impression. We need to get out and get into the place where God has called us to. Please hold your place here and turn to Jeremiah 29. This is an amazing passage. You may have seen it before. I've preached on it. I called it Prayer for the City. I just want to read it for you again. At least once a year, you're going to hear from your pastor and discipleship because it's my passion. That's why I left my last church. Came here because you guys were looking for what I was looking for. Bless my heart. I haven't stopped being blessed yet. I told you, I, I think I sent, there was 400 churches in the, I got from Moody that were looking for a pastor. Only two were looking for someone specifically to disciple them. Let's preach to that. I spoke at the other one as well, by the way. This was a better one. But this is why. It's all about getting into the community. Look at 29, verse 4. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and beget sons and daughters. And take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands, so that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive. And and pray to the Lord for it. For in its peace, you will have peace. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Do not let your prophets and your diviners who are in your midst deceive you. Nor listen to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord, after seventy years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you. I will perform my good word towards you. I will cause you to return to this place. Verse 11 to 13, we always read these verses, but we don't read the ones before. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, the thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Wow, there's a lot there, eh? He wants us in occupied territory. While we're here, this side of heaven, to seek the peace of the city, to pray for the city, to make sure shalom, which means more than just peace, the justice and the holiness of God reigns in our communities. We can't do that from a distance. We don't do that by writing a check, my friends. You see, God transforms a city by saving a soul, and he uses us as his hands and his feet to save those souls. Most people in Zion will never darken the door of this church. Would you agree with that one? 25,000 people. They're all invited. We'll give them all a Bible. We'd all give them ours. They're not coming. So they will never find Jesus in here. And if we don't go out there, chances are they won't, what? Find him at all. Because if we're not going and we're not speaking, they're not hearing. This is a big deal. And this is what I like to see. This is my goal for the church. I have resolutions. I don't call I mean goals. I don't call them resolutions. I call them goals. My goal for the church is that we would be intersecting with, that we would live incarnationally, that we would be missional, not just missions. You see that shaded area? Of course you do. That is the place of need. That's the place where they ask for mercy and God gives them grace. And it's where we do our best work, church. Outside the gate outside the self-effort that characterizes every human religion, out where the people are. Salt on the shelf is a waste of good spice, my friends. And the Bible says, and we've heard people say it this way, get out of the salt shaker and into the world. 
that's my desire. This is the last time you'll hear me preach from this pulpit in 2018. Maybe that's because we're all going to go to heaven in the rapture, which would be a really cool way to end the year. All right? Amen? That's got to get an amen. All right. We're not big ameners, but that's got to get one. I'll tell you what, though. If we wake up on January 1st and we're still here, then we're going to say, okay, Lord, what do you got for me? And it won't be, good Lord morning. You'll say, good morning, Lord. I got another chance. A canvas spread by love New Year's. Have you noticed that? A canvas spread out before me. What can God do? through us, this year, in this place, for His glory? That, that's the question that stirs my heart, puts a smile on my face, a spring in my step. Let's pray. Father, help us today. As we end one year and enter another, it's new, it's, it's not new, we understand that, we look the same, we live the same place, a lot of things aren't at all new. But it is new because every day is new. Every opportunity is an opportunity for you, and you've given it to us. And help us then, Father God, to take this message that we all love and we know it so well. Some of us have been dying for a chance to give it. Help us to break through whatever it is that holds us back. If we're, if we're concerned, if we're scared, if we tremble, if we waver, that's understandable. You love us anyway, but help us to remember the power that we have. And if we think it's not our job, please help us to get over that. Oh, Father, help us to realize that's a lie from the devil. Help us just to talk to our neighbors. I don't have the neighbors. The missionaries don't have the neighbors that, that, that these good folks have. Help us to go into our mission field. And then, Father God, help us to actually be involved. To be into, not of, but in and into the world, Father, trying to live Jesus in front of them. And I pray these things in his name and for his glory. Did I live with love and grace and dry the tear on some small face? Did I drink the sunlight in and look on losing as a win? Did I take the highest road? Did I repay the debt I owed? Search me, search me now, I pray, and wash my every sin away. Before the purple sunset skies, before the carpe diem dies, before I close my eyes to sleep and pray, for the Lord my soul to keep. Before I reach the end of day, I've got to know I've walked your way. Before the darkness shades the ground, before the sun goes down. Did I keep my word today and mean the things you heard me say? Did I make sincere amends with those I've wronged, my kin and friends? Did I seek to be more real? Did I verbalize the things I feel? Did I think on what is good and help my brother when I could? Before the purple sunset skies, before the carpe diem dies, before I close my eyes to sleep and pray, dear Lord, my soul to keep. Before I reach the end of day, I've got to know I've walked your way. Before the darkness shades the ground, 
before the sun goes down. As I reflect, I must confess that I might not have passed some test. I fell short in everything, for my poor flesh is limiting, and I regret my whole life through. I did not spend much time with you, but if there's time and one more breath, and one more hour of daylight. Before the purple sunset skies, before the carpe diem dies, before I close my eyes to sleep and pray, dear Lord, my soul to keep. Before I reach the end of day, I've got to know I've walked your way. Before the darkness shades the ground, before the sun goes down. Before the darkness shades the ground, before the sun goes down.